You've seen one of these before recently. This one's broken, so we're going to find out just why Otheus said it takes three hands and a small boy to take one of these things apart and make things for it. And on down the rabbit hole we go. This is the second lock out of the MG08 that we had when we went over and shot it in Georgia. This lock is here because upon disassembly, the alert crew at Sea and Arsenal noted that a chunk of metal come falling out of this thing. Um, that's a problem and we go, why is that chunk of metal in a bag? Well, if I drop it on the floor, it's a lot easier to find a bag than it is to find anything else. So as you guys probably heard when you saw the uh, 08 episode number one, that this is a very complex piece of kit to take apart. It's not, but it does require the proper tools. You are not disassembling this thing out in the field. There are a lot of interlocking pieces here that um, have to be attended to. Um, and it's got to go back together again in a certain order. I'm not gonna tell you that I'm an expert. I've only had this lock apart one time and it was about two months ago. So I don't understand this. So we're gonna go fumble our way through this thing um, together. So we've got a, a split head pin, a split head pin. There's another split head pin up underneath this arm that we've got to take care of to remove. There's so one, two, three of those pins and then there's another one up underneath here. The part that we broke, we'll dive down into it, but the part that we broke I believe is the part that keeps the slide from coming off. Right now the hammer is down so this lock is uncocked and I'm going to show you a little bit later that there's a firing pin sticking through right there. I'll tell you why that's going to be a problem in a minute. So the first thing I want to do is I want to cock this. You heard it cock, right? So when this is down, that's free to move down. Or actually, yeah, that's down. So this can come up, grab around, come back, come around, come down, and then lock back into position again. And when this part locks into position, it sets that sear right there in the end when that releases when you pull the trigger it'll drop it'll come down i don't want to this gun's got a flat spring in it we'll see that in a minute so where do you begin you're given a machine like this where the heck do you even begin you know i don't know we're gonna start by taking this out there's two ribs alongside this pin that go up and hold these uh hold these arms up in place. So I'm going to start by popping that out and you're going to hear a loud bang because the last time I did this the mainspring is going to let fly when we drive this out. So this pin is going to come out. Okay and we'll set that right there and then when this collar comes off is when we're going to start making noise here. That's the mainspring in this puppy. Break that, you're out of luck. It also doubles as the sear spring. Hardcore firearms designers always use both ends of a spring. Springs are parts. The more parts you have, the better the mousetrap you have. Yeah, buddy. That collar comes off and that allows these arms to displace. Well, all of this up in here is this this thing has absolutely had the life sucked out of it there's a lot of things going on up inside this lock so the next part that I want to take out this is the part that I think is broken now we could technically fix this without going all the way up inside this lock but we're here we've got a universal work holding system at our disposal three men and a small boy I think we're going to be able to get it Okay, so let's drive this special locking pin out that's made out of a special paper clip, apparently. So if you need small hammers and advice to take something apart, there's the pin over there. And I believe that the piece that was broken is the part that keeps this slide from coming out. Let's have a look here and see if we can't get that to fall free. Hmm. Yeah, maybe we got to take the sear out first. Okay, well, I'm going to go get a tool 
and we'll be right back. There comes a point in every one of these videos sometimes when I have to stop and do a little bit of research and I wanted to make sure I wasn't stepping in something. So I went and got a couple of tools and took it all the way apart again so that I could further articulate which direction I wanted to go. So what we note here is this is the whole fire control setup and if you really want to see a fabulous animation of this go back and look at the primer episode. Um, there's also an entire channel, some British Egg does some really, really, really incredibly good animations. That's the striker. This is the spring that drives the striker. This is the cocking piece that is cocked, right? And then this sear spring presses on the back of that. So when you pivot that out of the way, this will rotate down and that will come out and the, the nose of the firing pin will hit the primer if the safety sear is lifted out of the way. I'm sure I'm using the wrong words. I'm just looking at it f using words from uh, M16, FNFAL terminology. Just humor me. This is the first 08 lock I've ever had all the way apart on a bench uh, and talk about it. So you'll get to see how all this is put back together again when we go back. There are sleeves and then these headed pins go into with sleeve headed pin, sleeve headed pin. Every one of them is locked down with a cotter key. But uh, let's, oh, one last thing I want to tell you, you cannot take this arm off because this was pinned through here and through here. Those were peened over like we did when we made the part for the show show. They peened the heads over, made a rivet out of them. We're not taking that off. So this has got, this thing is knackered. I mean, it's got, there's a fabulous amount of side to slide up and down, um, Slop in this and the fact that this weapon will run with this kind of slop is probably how we were able to get it to come back to life again Which is absolutely amazing. So we're gonna go to what uh, an up-close shot here, and I want to show you the part that broke in, in high in high resolution here. Here we go. I'm trying a few new things here um, I'm trying actually a dedicated Close-up camera and you can see the red dots. I drew on the towel here so that we never move this camera and we have the ability to hand focus so that whatever I set on this table, I can pull up and make it nice and sharp so you all can see it. This is a drawing that I had as part of my research for this thing, for the uh, 1900 version of this lock. I think it's 1900. It's a 1900, 1910. This is the non-adjustable headspace, old school German version of this lock. All right. So when we took it apart, we noted that this piece right here had previously been noted to have broken and you can see here it's in two pieces and it's a testament to how sturdy this setup is that this piece was rattling around inside this lock and yet that, that it continued to function during routine maintenance it was taken apart and discovered to be broken okay so what does this thing do this piece right here there's a pin that sticks through it and that's this cutout Let's see, I got it rotated backwards, don't I? Let me rotate it into the correct orientation and get my fat little sausage fingers out of the way here. Bang. There's the correct orientation for the part, okay? What this part is doing is preventing the sliding part that moves up and down from falling off the gun. There's a piece up at the top that stops it. Up here, there's an up stop. This is the down stop inside the cavity right uh, right here inside this cavity is where this projection right here runs into that and it keeps it from falling off so this part here slides up and down we'll get into that here in a minute but what i can see from this is i don't have to cut one of these things out of solid steel all this piece does is provides a uh, a bearing surface but it doesn't even have to be this long and i don't even know why it's shaped like this and i do not know this but it almost looks like it's a legacy part left over from one of the earlier designs of this lock and it's just like i don't know but what i do know is that all it does is sticks through the front and when the top part of it broke off this pin and this surface here still had it captured so it was still operating this is not a piece that I have to cut out of a solid chunk of steel to make another one up. We're going to fire up the torch and brass braze this back together again. All it's got to do is be in one piece and go. 
um, because I'm sure the 24 hour 08 parts store probably doesn't have one of these kicking about. Failure analysis. We're almost there at the end of failure analysis because to just fix something doesn't mean you don't know why it broke. There's a projection sitting out here that stops this coming up. And that's on the, um, on the backstroke is when it comes back. But when it comes around and loads the, chain, loads the round on the chamber, it's down like this. And the stud sticks out of this window right here and it hits that surface. So you put this on and then you set the stud back in. So now it's trapped at its downward motion and at its upward motion. So it's running into that stud. It's hitting it. And I guess just it just eventually didn't want to play anymore. Who knows? It's a hundred and something years old. The design's 118 years old. And the origins of the design go back 10 years before that. So it is what it is. So that leads us to options. It does not move. It's held in place and captured. It's captured by a pin. Where did I set that? There it is, right there. It's captured by a pin. Where is that pin? Ah, all right. Well, there it is. It's captured by a pin that goes in that hole right there. So it's not supposed to move. Okay. So we're going to go braze this part back together again. We're going to use an uh, oxycetylene torch and heat this thing up. And we're going to see if we can't get this to come back together as one homogenous piece. We'll do a quick test to make sure that it was in one part. And then we're going to go on to another part of this and what I did my last episode in the head spacing episode is going to become painfully obvious why I had to run that before we did this. Failure analysis time. I'm cleaning this thing up to, um, to braise it. And you see this big chunk of rust right here? At some time, long time ago, there was a pit or a crack or a void and something got up inside this, let's call it water corroded this and as this stress joint opened up and opened up and opened up it got to the point where this web could not support the impact load on the end of that tit so all we're and it and it snapped it brittle it brittle fractured you can see the spot there you can see it there so what we're going to do is come in here and clean all of this off and then i'm just going to braise this together real quick and meet you back over at the bench hey all you junior gunsmiths out there this is one of the very, very few things that you should actually use a Dremel for. Raised it together, filed it, you can see the brass down in here. The brass penetrated all the way around to the back side, back over here, filed it off smooth, and we're there. So our repaired piece sits in here like that. That part is going to hit up against the inside of this recess right here. So if we slide this up in, let me get this up in here so that it sits through the aperture. What's in the way there? Ah, there we go. My arms are too short. Why did jam in there? There we go. We're just about there. There we go. Let's get that right there. Bang. So that piece sticks through that. So we'll just fold that back. Put the top of the slide on. Put that back out again. And then that holds it from coming out. So it stays, okay, and let me put this pin in so I can pick it up and show it to you clearer, okay. So now, with that, it doesn't come off. Um, I have high confidence that that's going to work. So let me go back over to the, um, to the, to the, the close-up camera and show you where some slop starts working into this thing. This piece right here, and let me get the focus right. Remember, we unlocked the focus on this so I can pull it right there. Yeah, buddy. Okay, um, just throw me my pencil, will you, please? I'm gonna show him something I didn't bring it. Right there on a the bench. Right there, straight in. There you go, outstanding. Okay, this part right here wears. This is two metal parts sliding on each other, okay? So this thing actually has in and out slop. It'll 
it's look at that look at that slop in that right there and in and out slop right there so part of just remember that that slop is there between the back of the cartridge and the front of the bolt body just remember that and i'm going to set up a little display here all right i'm going to build you guys a little tech demonstrator here oh what the hell with it let's just get a bigger hammer and crack this thing get a pair of pliers get my hand out of the way i'm trying to make a point here not how you'd put a screw in but works for me okay what i have here is a diagramic representation of this entire system and then all i'm lacking here and i'm and i'm, and I'm still talking real quick no dead air i need a cartridge ah we we'll use this cartridge because i'm sure that this round will show up on the air quite well okay so here's my bullet and it's sitting up in the front end of this thing and when this gun unlocks this toggle comes down pulls this part down this whole thing cocks back out of the way it goes all the way around okay i get that and then when it comes back it all stacks back up again so let's talk about tolerance stacking and how it affects head space and here's where i'm tying this back together and why i had to put the headspace video out if you're not able to adjust the headspace on this system here's what's going to happen headspace is from the abutment to the datum line well we know the datum line in this system is my index finger all the way in here still okay datum line in this cartridge to the abutment well where's the abutment well it's back here no it's not it's back here no it's not it's back here no it's not it's back here the abutment's all the way back here you see and all of this can move so as this gun wears it might start out up here this part is pushed forward everything's unworn and as this gun wears as that joint wears as this joint wears and as this joint wears the distance from the datum line to the abutment begins to grow it just all the slop comes out of this bang and all of a sudden we are out of headspace now this is fantastically exaggerated in order to make my point but on this particular gun all of this constitutes a loss of headspace as this thing gets knackered and it gets old that journal bearing that or i'm sorry that bearing that bearing this how this thing comes in it's an interrupted thread comes in and turns so this flat spot right here this bearing right here being all kinds of wobbly you can hear how you can see how this thing wobbles so as this goes and then as this slide part here goes so what i did to the other 08 we're going to go over to the tight camera and i'm going to show you what i did to the other lock to make it not have the cartridges wander. And I'm back to my tight up here and I've got another picture set here. I wanna show you the difference between the old school lock that we're working on and the newer lock. And what they had done, and I believe this is a 1910, if I remember it right, I've never held one of these locks in my hand, but this gizmo right here, without modifying the engineering on the rest of the gun, I don't know, but boy, that sure looks like something you can screw in and out in order to take up the longitudinal slack in this system. This system doesn't have any way to take any of those bearings or any of that slop out of it. This one appears to, I've never held one in my hand. I, I don't know, don't gig me on that, but I, that's what it appears like. Cause that's where I would put it if I was engineering this thing from Jump Street and I didn't want to re-engineer the rest of the gun. Now, if I'm wrong, there could possibly be at the back end of all that stuff that I had on the table, there could be a way to move that back joint in and out. Um, that part here where the joint kind of went backwards like this and up. If there was a way to slide this in and out. I don't know how they did it on the 0815. I've never been inside of one. Either way, you got to have a way to take that slop out of it. There's another place you can take a little bit of slack out of it that I'm sure a unit armor would not have done. This rail, and let me pull the focus again here. Do -do -do. Bang, right there. This rail right here, this slides on and off this rail. So this gives you a T-shaped, T-shaped setup here, which and, and as that wears, this can move in and out. It can move back and forth and it can move side to side. This setup looks suspiciously like a 1911, doesn't it? When you take a 1911 and you throw the slide on it, it's the same setup. 
It's also how a locomotive cylinder gib is done. There's a lot of things. This, this is all railroad uh, engineering. Bruno was commenting on that. He was looking at some of the animation for the 1919 and he said, my God, if you look at it like it's a railroad locomotive, it makes a fabulous amount of sense. Well, if you're gonna accurize in 1911, you tighten these rails up significantly and you do it one of several ways. You can, um, grab my little two ounce ball peen, please. I wanna make a, I wanna just demonstrate something here. You can, right there, outstanding. You can hit it right there. And by doing that, it'll push this rail down. And I don't mean hit it hard, because this stuff will move. All the, the, it's even, even when properly hardened, metal will move small distances. We could tap this down. We could also tap these rails down. Now, the last lock we had had bowl of wet spaghetti noodles slop in it side to side and the cartridges are actually wandering side to side and when you slow the gun down you get a jam when it was running fast you wouldn't this particular web this particular lock doesn't do that and i got news for you i'm not fixing it if it isn't broke so i'm not going to do that but that's another place we could get rid of things that are messing up our um our headspace um also in this system right here I gotta see if I can't get this where you can just see the pins. Right there, there they are. There's a pin right there, and there's a pin right there. Those pins were driven through the ends were mushroomed over, and the thing was filed off flat. Uh, ain't messing with that either. And then while I got you in close up, you can see this interrupted thread here. This interrupted thread. You just slide it up there, it goes, that's actually a pretty good shot of it right there. You slide it in and rotate it a quarter of a turn and it locks up. I'm trying to keep you in focus here, guys. Um, you, you slide it in, turn it a quarter of a turn and it locks back into the, uh, locks back into the action. All righty. So uh, let's get back to putting this thing back together again, huh? going to come out of light speed here for a second and I'm going to show you something. These arms are what lift and drop. Those arms are captured by this. Okay. And all of that mess has to go together while fighting the tension on this spring. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Here we go.
<laughs> we're gonna let the camera cool down be right back with a universal work holding device this becomes dramatically simpler Still got to get it all aligned up there. Man, down behind it, up behind it. There we go. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Yeah, buddy, I'm gonna tell you what, interesting ride down inside of an 08 lock, or a Maxim lock. Um, it has rained almost eight inches here in the last two weeks. So the, the, the mud is up to my knees deep. I'm not gonna put this in a gun and drag all that stuff back out there and shoot it. I know you guys like to see that. Um, but I just hope you got the whole basics of applying headspace to this gun and showing a simple repair to a hundred and something year old equipment that just doesn't have any more parts. See on the backside, stand by for updates. I'm gonna pop a few after this, bye. Got asked a couple of things that I wanted to clarify here at the end of this, at the end of this statement of what the heck is a go, a no-go and a field gauge? What is it? Okay, well, the first thing I wanna tell you is these are three gauges to allow you to judge headspace without doing a chamber casting or without doing anything weird. Okay, so here you go. The go gauge says that the chamber is long enough. So the go gauge, the bolt should be able to come up against the back end of this go gauge and there should be the plus room available. There's a notch cut out on the back of some of these to allow the extractor to kind of fit in. But if you're really going to use a go or a no-go gauge, you should take the extractor out and get anything else that would put any pressure on this. The abutment pushes up against the back end of the go gauge, and if it went in the chamber, there's a little bit of space. The no-go gauge tells you that the chamber is short enough. Remember there was a spec on how long that chamber is supposed to be. So this is the minus depth right here, okay? So if you gotta go in a no-go gauge, they're probably six thousandths of an inch difference from one another, and they're designed as a quick test to tell you whether or not the chamber is long enough and the chamber is short enough, okay? The field gauge says, in a military environment, if the no-go gauge drop, the bolt drops on the no-go gauge because the chamber has just burned open to the point where it'll actually fit, the field gauge says, ah, this is a rough test to say whether or not we might want to leave this thing in theater or give it to some back room guard or some guy guarding a train, but let's maybe perhaps think about taking it out of frontline service because eventually a piece of brat's going to fail in it and tie the gun up. So we really only know if it's actually going to go bang once or do we ship it out of theater, ship it back home to get rebarreled. Go, no go, field. One more thing I want to talk about and, and is the fact that a unlocked breech gun will push forward on this until all of the headspace disappears. So a straight blowback gun has, by definition, no headspace. A shotgun headspace is just like a gun that headspace is on the rim. I got to ask this question too. Headspace in a shotgun is by the rim because you just have the forcing cone up here, so there's nothing holding it. If you get a gun out of, if you get a shotgun out of headspace, even at the low pressures that they operate at, this will blow and dump gas everywhere, and it's ugly. So for a shotgun, uh, headspace is as or more vital. All right, thanks a lot, guys.